warm welcome to you from the Accor Arena in Bercy in the east of wonderful Paris. It feels like a really big night for the sport of MMA in France. Made legal only a couple of years ago, thriving in some communities, attracting massive interest in this wonderful city. These could be hugely significant times in the sport of MMA as this sports mad country embraces its joy and wonder. Our main event, the rematch between Ryan Bader and Czech Congo. No love lost after a controversial no contest three years ago. And the Bellator World Heavyweight title on the line as the 46-year-old Frenchman looks to become MMA's oldest champion. And this was the stare down. Congo, fierce and in the mood. And Bader, the champion, super relaxed and ready to go. And a little bit bemused by the animosity maybe coming his way, but it's gonna be good and it's coming up later. Elsewhere on a stacked main card, the laid back Alex Easy Polizzi faces a legend in Yoel Romero. Kyle Stewart gets the chance of a lifetime against Lorenz Larkin. The Frenchman Gregory Babin and Davy Gallon take center stage against Mike Shipman and Benjamin Brander. We have some night in front of us. It is time though for our prelim prelims we have eight in total we get underway appropriate enough with two frenchmen victor vacher and burama kamara john mccarthy is with me and to start off with a tail of the tape you picked out that reach differential take a look at that reach of kamara 79 inches that is a long reach in this weight class we'll see if he can use that to get his win time now for the first time this evening as the arena already is filling up we wait for the fighters to make their way into the cage. And now we can head to Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome as Bellator brings MMA back to Paris, France tonight. Bellator 280, the prelims start now. Inside the Bellator cage, we get it going with three five-minute rounds in the welterweight division. Introducing first fighting out of the blue corner at six foot four, weighing in 170.4 pounds in his Bellator debut. He stands with four professional victories, just one loss, fighting out of Paris, France, presenting Muhammad Kamaha. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at six foot, weighing in 169.2 pounds, making his Bellator debut. He brings a professional record with five wins, one loss. He too fights out of Paris, France, introducing Victor Verchez. And when the bell rings, the referee in charge, Mike Beltran. So we get underway, Barama Kamara already switching early on in those blue gloves, six foot four, oh, taking those shots from Victor Vercher, huge right hook, and he mixes it up with those leg kicks as well. What a positive start from Vercher. Combinations, John. Vercher has landed that left hook twice and just blasted Kamara. He's got, Kamara's got to look at using that reach advantage that he has. Right now, he's fighting in a phone booth. Good shot to the body as well from Vercher. Real variety to his work in these early stages. Kamara looks like uh, he hasn't got started at all and he might not get a chance to. Another right hand and left hook from Vercher. That left hook has been money for Vercher. He is, every time he has thrown it, it has found the mark. Doing the groundwork with those Leg kicks as well, Vercher. What a big target. And Kamara is not. 
doing the stand-up as he should. He's getting in too close. He's switching constantly as well, which I think is almost confusing him. <laughs> Again, got to tell you, I think right now it's just, it's everything. It's the atmosphere. It's the crowd. He's looking, and he's in his hometown and wanting to do so well. He's just got to calm himself down, start to relax, figure out the range, because right now he's not in control. That was a nice jab that he landed, though. That was better. He used the southpaw jab and landed the left hand, but Bashir straight back with power. Just feels as if the more experienced Bashir has settled that much better. He's also attacking. You look at the way Bashir is attacking. Look at he's everything. Up, down, kicks to the legs. He's utilizing a, a variety of attacks, and that's going to... It's always going to cause more problems for your opponent. It's a great system to go with. And his opponent right now, Kamara, is basically he's being a boxer. Kamara lost last time for the first time against the Visser Makmouche here in Paris. So he doesn't necessarily come here with bundles of confidence. Well, he's starting, you can see that he's starting to actually feel better. He's starting to get the range a little bit. And he's starting to land. So this is good. It's just a matter of the nerves, all of that adrenaline in the beginning. He's starting to settle down. Let's see what he does. Just a touch of blood to the nose and mouth of Vercher, who for the first time starting to reach a little bit for his yeah, shots there. The, again, it's that range difference. Nice flying knee attack. Didn't land where he wanted to, but still, now it's making Vercher think. And Vercher is more on his heels. Take a look at who is backing up now. Completely different attack. Suddenly, Kamara feels relaxed. Great right Big hand. Shot. Kamara oh. with the finish. The moment he relaxed, the moment he settled, the moment he calmed down, he got the job done. Brilliant finish from Burama Kamara here in front of a massive crowd in his hometown. Well, just take a look at that young man. And you can tell how nervous he was coming in. Once he settled down, he started getting the range, started landing big shots. That was a beautiful attack at the end. And Vacher, who started so well, must have realized that it was turning. Nice to see Kamara going over to check that Vacher is okay. Let's take a look at that finish again, John. And take a look, you can see as the range, look at that right hand land, power on it, and then comes down to finish him off with the ground and pound attack. But it was before that, Dave, you could see there was a moment in time, that was a beautiful right hand. There was a moment in time, probably 30 seconds before that, where you saw Kamara all of a sudden, he started moving his feet and he found that range and you could tell he started to get comfortable and that's the difference right there. If anyone ever tries to tell you that fighting isn't about fluency and rhythm and timing, watch that. That's it. Confidence and being smart. Still a huge smile on the face of Burama Kamara. Let's get it up to make it official to Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, it comes to an end officially. Three minutes, six seconds. Round number one, the winner by knockout, Buhamba Kamara. Long levers, great power, name to watch in the future because he is massive at the weight. Burama Kamara, great start to the night. Over to you, Aiden and to Josh Thompson for the first time this evening. Much welcome to the fight desk. I didn't think Josh Thompson would be out of a seat this early this evening, but already you've been up hollering and whooping and cheering. You enjoyed that. What a great that's start. That's how you start the night. If you guys are trying to make a name for yourself in this organization, I'm telling you, that's how you start the night. Rashir came out, was on fire, had some electric shots right off the bat. Kamara just stayed patient. He, almost like he was working in slow motion in the first minute, minute and a half. Then he just lit up. He looked like the faster fighter at the end, but in the beginning, he was trying to find his rhythm. Wow. A wow. great That's start. That's how you great do it. Back and forth, and we hope for 
Plenty more of that this evening. So it is Bellator 280. It is a night that will culminate in a heavyweight world title rematch between the undisputed champion, Ryan Bader, the number two ranked Czech Congo. As we look at the rankings, we see Bader sits atop the division where he remains unbeaten, coming off an unanimous decision win over the then interim champion, Valentin Maldovsky, in his return to heavyweight. And the number two ranked Czech Congo has earned another shot at realizing his lifelong dream to win a world title by submitting Sergei Karatanov. Tonight, he is back in front of his hometowns, and Josh, we know this is a rematch that is dripping with bad blood, all because of a controversial incident that happened in their first meeting in 2019. And for many people, the problem is they cannot see the accidental eye poke. You have 50-50 vision, Josh. Yes. And you see it. Because hindsight is 50-50 in my world. We call him Joshism. Look. The shot right there that you just saw, it didn't look like it hit him or poked him in the eye. So a lot of people, when you look at the replay, it really came down that we didn't see it. When you slow down the replay, the thumb went up the nose. We didn't see the actual eye poke itself. Czech was obviously very upset. He was upset with the media for saying that he faked it. He was upset with a lot of people. A lot of people. A lot of people. A lot of people. But the overall, the overall position of this is guess what? The great thing about being a fighter is we get to run it back. Indeed they both, we do. They both are here now, and they were both for the title tonight. And guess what? We have an opportunity to find out who was going to really win that first fight, and we're going to sell it tonight. It's been three years in the making. We are just a few hours away from that unfinished business. And scores to settle here in the city of love. I tell you, this place is fitting up very, very quickly, and it's time now for us to move on to fight number two at middleweight, Yusef Uabas, Machieletto Duclo. We can get to Michael. And now, set to make his way to the cage, Mafia Leto Duclo. Well, a few people I know who were at the Salle Gerard Philippe in Saint Genevieve des Bois in the middle of March, not far from here, saw Mathieu Leto Duclos and were really impressed. He won by a round two corner stoppage against an opponent who may not have had the most stellar record, but there was a savagery in the way that he went about his business that certainly had a few people talking here in Paris and around the French scene as well. He may have lost on debut. He's won two in a row now and another big display here will really set tongues wagging this remember is a chance for all of these fighters to impress on a bigger stage than they've been on before and now here's opponent ready to make his way to the cage you said Obamas. Well, Yusef Uabas was supposed to fight on that same card in March, but injury meant that he wasn't able to, so he comes here for a third professional fight, which comes nearly three years after his second. He's unbeaten. He's won a decision and via a first-round KO, but it's hard to know, really, what to expect from him. One thing, though, just to reiterate, that we can say with confidence, John, is that this is a huge opportunity for both of these men. Absolutely, for both of them. What we're, what we're looking Looking out of Yusef, look, the guy's got good stand-up. He's got a decent ground game. He needs to control the pace and the placement of this fight. If he does that, he'll get his win. If he doesn't, he might be in for a long night. The tail of the tape between the middleweights, Yusef Wabas and Mathieu Leto Duclos. And that record shows how early on they both are. And that's the whole point right here. Is both are very young in their career, 2-0, 2-1. Both have a lot of upside. Let's get it on. Let's get to the cage. Let's get to Michael C. Williams. For all those joining us live streaming the prelims on YouTube at Bellator MMA and Showtime Sports, we welcome you to Paris as we get set now. Fight number two tonight here at Bellator 280 goes three five-minute rounds in the middleweight division. Introducing the blue corner at six foot three, weighing in 185.8 pounds tonight. He makes his Bellator debut with two professional 
victories, one defeat, fighting out of Paris, France, presenting Mafia Leto Duclos. And across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at six foot three, weighing in 185.2 pounds for his debut in the Bellator cage. He enters undefeated at two and oh, he fights out of Paris, France, presenting you said Obama. Your referee in charge, Brian Miner. So Mathieu Leto Duclos in those blue gloves lost on debut against the same fighter who beat Barama Kamara, Wissam Akmouche, and has won twice since against an inactive Youssef Uabas. But they both got fans in here, all right. Uabas already trying to throw those feints and try and draw the shots from Leto Duclos. Well, you'll notice Uabas, he, he's very good with his footwork at controlling distance and making his opponent come into him and throwing counters. But with Duclos, oh! Early success for Duclos, and he piles on the pressure here. Too much pressure for Abbas, who somehow gets back to his feet. I was gonna say, the problem with Duclos is he's got power in his hands. In the fights that I watched him with, when he hits people, they react. That tells you that he's got some sting on the end of those shots. Needs to just stay calm here. Wabas is still shaken. He is still not very steady. You can see him trying to shake out the cobwebs, right? And blinking a little bit. Movement right now is a good idea. He still, you saw how his leg went a little stiff just off of that jab. Still not collected. Is Duclo thinking enough here to Try and set something up with that jab and catch him with the right hand again. He tried, didn't he? But good reactions there from Wabas. He, he tried, but you got to be very impressed at a young point in his career with only three fights. He didn't crush that space. He didn't go crazy. He didn't burn himself out. He just is staying with what got him to the dance and just looking for that shot that's going to end it. It's good, though, from Wabas, but he still looks a little bit shaky and he looks now for the takedown and Duclos was having none of that he is controlling or has controlled the opening couple of minutes of this fight yeah Duclos really has Wabas on his back foot take a look as he, as Wabas is trying he's trying to you know control get some little bit of respect out of Duclos he's just unable to at this point Well, Wabas has thrown that right hand off the back foot a couple of times and not really hurt Duclos with it, not look like uh, hurting him. And Duclos seems to be hurting Uabas, who again looks for that takedown. He were a nice little left hook from Duclos as he was trying to exit. Uabas grabbing a hold of that clinch, and that's smart. That's showing that his head is in the game. He knows where he's at. He knows what he's doing. Let me slow this down right now. Almost feels like Wabas is using a bit of ring craft here, a bit of cage craft. He is, and you have to be impressed at only two professional fights that he was able to withstand being hurt, get himself back. He's done the right things. He, he does the things you're looking for. Instead of biting down on the mouthpiece and, and just starting to throw to try to get his opponent back, he just got hit again, though. The first switch to South oh, Wabas caught him as he came in, but again, Duclos just shook it off. There is no question who's more heavy-handed here. Yeah, no doubt about it. That's what we were talking about. Right now, Wabas is doing anything he can to try to slow down the progression of Duclos. He just can't do it. When Duclos lands that jab, either southpaw or orthodox, he sets everything up. That's Pretty. 
incredible glory of this sport, John. What a finish, what a result for Youssef Uabas. Uabas in this, that beautiful right hand is what set it up. You saw it hit clean. He hurt Duclos bad like he is. Watch the right hand. Clean right there, right on the chin. Too close. Going as we say, stanky leg, trying to hold his balance. Both of them at this point a little bit wobbly, but too close is really in trouble. Referee is not going to let him get starched. That was actually a good stop. Yeah, Brian Miner did really well, yes, didn't he, he did. to jump in when he did, but. All smiles here from Youssef Uabas. Hadn't fought since June 2019, and we said beforehand what a big night it was for both of them. And you can see as Uabas takes the acclaim of the fans here in Paris just how much it means to him. You'd watch that again, actually. Great scrap between them. Could have gone the other way, but it's Uabas who found a way. And we can make it official now with Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, it comes to an end officially. Four minutes, 17 seconds. Round number one, the winner by TKO. Still undefeated, you said Robas. What a fight, what a start to the night. Plenty for Josh and Aiden to try and make sense of. Here in Paris, another stoppage, and it comes in the first round. John McCarthy believes Brian Miner was correct to stop it when he did. Josh Thompson, do you agree? So look, I don't agree with the stoppage, but I understand also too for fighter safety. But to be honest, because you can see earlier in the fight, Awabas was losing the fight and he was able to come back. And that's kind of where I was at in like letting the fighters fight. Because DeClose was, he was actually doing all the damage early. Then he got in trouble, he was able to come back. So I wanted to see how this fight came to run. He was the one coming forward. He was the one pressing the action. Basically on stanky leg as John likes to call it. But it was, it was shaping up to be a great fight. We've seen in the very first two fights of the night tonight, just the back and forth battles, being hurt. This is, I'm afraid for the rest of the fighters for the rest of the night. They've got a lot, of, they've got a lot to live up to. You bet they do. Uh, and that includes our main card as well from Paris Bellator. Wow. 280, of course, headlined by a highly anticipated rematch between the champion, Ryan Darth Bader and the hometown hero, the challenger, Czech Congo. We will be live on Showtime at 4 o'clock Eastern okay. and on BBC Go Three ahead. in the UK at 9 p.m. British Standard Time when we will kick off our main card with an explosive middleweight matchup between London's Mike Shipman squaring off against French submission specialist Gregory Babin. Then the monsoon Lorenz Larkin competes at 185 for the second time in a row as he looks to stay active and increase his five-fight win streak against Bellator newcomer Kyle Stewart. Also, top European lightweights David Galan and Benjamin Brander collide as they both chase a spot in the rankings and in our co-main event the soldier of God Yoel Romero will look to add another knockout to his extensive highlight reel when he battles it out with fast rising light heavyweight contender Alex Easy Polizzi and I gotta say it Josh there is nothing easy about this one for either man you just stole my line right there because Alex Easy Polizzi will not be an easy fight for Yoel Romero stylistically they match up very well what you're gonna see is the two of them rest Wrestling back and forth. Who is the, who has the better pedigree of wrestling? Yo Romero, absolutely. But with his age being a factor, will he be able to wrestle hard for a full three rounds? Alex Polizzi has proven that he can take the damage and keep pressing the pace. And we saw in Yoel Romero's last fight against Phil Davis, when the wrestling started getting incorporated, he started to slow down dramas drastically. So in this fight, Alex Polizzi's Alex Polizzi got to make sure that he starts off at a fast pace without taking a lot of damage like he did in his last fight and wrestling and wrestling and really trying to slow Yoel down. Well, we've seen early stoppages already tonight. Could we see an early stoppage in that one yeah yes we could because Joel Romero is dynamic he's explosive he possesses a ton of power and when he gets on top he's probably the nastiest fighter in that top position but you've got to wrestle to get there so we've got to see him utilize his wrestling early and I think we will all right promises to be great let the prelims continue Dave 
Thanks very much indeed, Aidan. What a night we've had already. And next up, it's the flyweights as uh, Lucy Berto, another local fighter, and Katarzyna Sadora take center stage. Let's get them to the cage with Michael. And now, ready to make her way to the Bellator cage, please welcome Katarzyna Sadora. Well, sometimes in the fight game, you get a real sense that good things come to those who wait. And Katarzyna Sadora may just be starting to fit that bill. She's never shirked a challenge, most notably when she went to fight the significantly bigger Sinead Kavanagh five and a half years ago. She's been beaten three times since on other difficult nights. But last October, she went to Moscow to fight the local favorite, Darina Majduk. She found a way to win a second round TKO. And tonight, she once again goes up against the local favorite, but don't write her off no you definitely could not write her off because she is there's one thing she's tough take a look she stood in the pocket during this fight in russia against an opponent who had the home crowd going for her and just systematically beat her to the point where she could not continue on in the fight effectively anymore it was a great performance and it's what you want to see out of your fighters and you know what they have a game plan, they come and they execute, and they get that win. And now we welcome her opponent, Lucy Fireball Berto. Since the age of 15, Lucie Berto dreamed of fighting at this symbolic arena. 20 years later, after boxing successfully, having a career as a journalist and inspiring everyone around her, this extraordinary person gets her moment in the Parisian sun for the second time. She's always taken big risks. She says she wants to live her life to 100%, take every single opportunity that's in front of her. And she also told me the other day she wants a beautiful end to her story. Tonight might just be the beginning, but the journey journey to get here is a notable one and I tell you she's been on reality TV in France she's got huge support here as well this has the makings of a terrific fight The tail of the tape between the flyweights here, Lucy Berto and Katagina Sadora. And John, take a look at the difference between those reaches. Five inch difference right there that you're seeing. Biggest problem is Berto needs to use that boxing footwork to get inside. Let's get now to Michael C. Williams. Well underway here in Paris, we welcome those joining us live in the UK on BBC iPlayer here at Bellator 280. The prelims continue in the flyweight division scheduled now for three five-minute rounds. We introduce first the fighter out of the blue corner at five foot seven, weighing in 125.2 pounds. Her professional record five and four from Lodz, Poland. Please welcome Katarzyna Sadura. And across the cage, her adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot six, weighing in 125.2 pounds as a professional. She's three and three. She fights out of Paris, France, introducing Lucy Fireball Berto. In charge, your referee Mike Beltran. So Lucy Berto in the red gloves here against Katagina Sador. A good shot from Berto with that left hook right at the start. She started like she means business. She's already won on Bellator debut in this arena against Maggie Burchell back in October 2020. And she really wants to go places, but she's got some opponent in front of her here. She's got a very awkward opponent in front of her, the one that uses kicks very well, comes from a Taekwondo background. And so 
What Lucy needs to do is utilize that footwork, create the angles that make it difficult for those kicks to touch her, while she can use what is her skill set, her hands, to put them on Sidora. Sidora already looking to land those kicks. She's got a lovely fluency about her work, Sidora, when she gets going, when she gets into the rhythm. You can even see that in that fight against Sinead Cavanaugh. The problem was, of course, that the size differential, the heavy-handedness of Sinead. Nice job by Sidura to take the fight to the ground. And that is that is a great game plan because Lucy wants to be on her feet. That's where she's comfortable. So take her and put her into a place where she's not wanting to be. Smart move by Sidura. Sidura has one win via submission. Last defeat was uh, on the floor as well. Fire arm triangle against Vladena Yavoskaya. Well, she's comfortable here. Certainly more comfortable than Lucy Berto. Has been working at her ground game, but as you say, comes from a very strong boxing background. Well, Berto's using what we call a, a mission control position. It's rubber guard from the 10th Planet system by Eddie Bravo, just to control the posture of Sedura. And right now it's working well because, yes, she is on her back, but she's not absorbing any kind of damage at all. Bateau controlling it nicely from the bottom. Bateau now moving to a more conventional guard. You see how she get, she's controlling that posture so that Sidura cannot create enough space to do any damage to her. Yeah, she can punch her like she is with those body shots, but there's no real power on them. It's, it's an arm punch, and it's not going to do any real damage. She talks about her defense being one of her biggest strengths, trying to develop that instinct to her toe. No, standing them up. It's a win for Lucy Berto. Well, it is a win for Lucy Berto, and you can question, you know, the referee doing it, but he had given Sidura enough chances to try to move herself to a better position so she could be more offensive, and she never did it. So it's understandable. When she made her Bellator debut in this cage, she was six weeks away from going on the big French reality show, and she was telling me the other day that she felt real pressure because they'd said if you get hit in the face and bruised and bloody, you can't come on the show. So not only did she have to win, she had to win in a certain way. And she said she was more relieved than anything that she was able to do that. It's not an easy thing to do going into the fight saying okay, you can't have a mark on you. Tonight's different though. Tonight's TV up people. a level. They no, they're the very world. demanding, John. <laughs> Closing that gap again. Ah, nice job by Lucy Berto to use her hands to get to that clinch. Now she's the one in the top position. Let's see the difference. If there is one here, let's see what Sidura does to control what Lucy is able to do as far as damage. And Sidura couldn't really make any impact from that top position. Is it going to be different here with? Lucy Berto, Sidora's done well to Sidora did back a to her feet. Great job of continuing to scoot herself all the way to the cage wall, using it to wall walk herself back to a standing position. The head position of Lucy Berto right now is very good. It's giving Sidora a lot of problems. around this from both of them In different ways but we head to the final 10 seconds lots for both of them to think about after that has Claudio Silva in her corner, Lucy Berto, but Yuri Bejanari, former IMAF world champion, former Bellator fighter, is uh, in charge tonight. And uh, David Pavlovsky, who's Katarzyna's fiance, is uh, with her.
This was the takedown by Stern. Look at nice job of getting the double unders and basically just lifts her off feet. And that's when you're taller and longer, you can do those things. Then here comes Lucy Berto. Beautiful go behind, gets her to the ground, and then again comes in off of her hands, right away to the body lock, elevates her up, turns her over to the right. Nice job by Lucy Berto. Lucy Berteau in those red gloves and Katagina Sadora the pole, the taller fighter here in the blue gloves and it shows, as we mentioned in those opening couple of fights, the glorious unpredictability of this sport. I think everyone had this as stand up all the way. Look at the way it's gone so far. That's amazing. Both women coming from stand up backgrounds, Taekwondo, boxing, and now utilizing a ground attack at times. Sidor needs to be very careful. She starts to lift that chin when Berto comes in. She needs to be careful of keeping that chin tucked down. She does like to utilize those kicks, just finding range with them and isn't far away with a knee there. So just needs to be a little bit careful there. Sidora noticeably is starting to throw more of those kicks. Just take a little bit of a risk with them as well. And when she decides to throw them, they've got some steam on them. It's not like, it's, you know, a light kick. She's putting a lot into those things. And the one, you can see as it hit, it hurt Lucy. Nice wizard. Good job. Lucy gets to take down. Stirs it. will stop it with the wizard. Get back to her feet. Right here again, as you can see, Dave, look at the head position. She's using that head as a third arm. It starts to push the head of Sadura in the direction, makes her weaker. It helps Lucy in trying to work for this takedown. Someone, Lucy Bateau, who used to work as a journalist all day and then was a fighter by night, an MMA superhero. An MMA superhero? All right. <laughs> Certainly her friendship group in Paris, all the journalists used to call her that, and now she's, of like course, that. focusing on this. <laughs> Desperate, of course, to make an impression here again in her home city and uh, home now anyway for her. And to move to who knows where on this MMA journey. Quite a good job here of neutralizing each other. How did you score that opening round, John? I, you know, in the opening round, eventually, I, at the end, I would have thought that Lucy Berto possibly snuck that round out, but it was a very close round. But as things are going, you know, both women have their times of being able to land things. The kicks of Sidura could be a big difference in this, but it seems to me that Lucy Berto is able to utilize the grappling attack, which normally she didn't do. Obviously, she's training down at American Top Team, she did for a while and stuff. She's learned a lot of good stuff and is able to control the body of Sidur. And right now, that's giving her the edge. See, and right here, Lucy Berto could take her backside. She could take that leg, take her right leg, block the legs of Sidur and bring her to the backside and put her right down on the ground. And Sidur is even stepping into it at times. I think Lucy likes the position that she's in. She feels like she's doing some damage with this clinch work, dirty boxing type stuff. It's just keep on doing it till it adds up to something big. Yeah, it's one of those situations, isn't it? The last couple of minutes here that it might not look explosive, but it's the kind of thing that can ultimately win you the fight. She's getting a lot of work in there, Berto. She's getting a lot of work, and Sadura's not getting much. You know, and that's the real thing. There's not a lot that she's been able to do offensively from this position. So a lot of time, there you go. That's why I was talking about bringing her backside. Can she make anything of this position now? Well, she's got a little bit of time here with 48 seconds. It would be nice if she could have gotten that hook. She needs to work towards getting that again. Hip pressure right now as Sadura's going to try to stand up. 
That's the third time that Sadora has done a good job of that. Now we're back in the same position where Bateau wants to work from. Round started with Sadora coming out and using those kicks, but Bateau has managed to neutralize that. It's and up close, she's winning, isn't she? It's tough to kick when you're pressed up against your opponent. Not the fight that we expected, but it's full of intrigue. It's not the fight we expected, but it's a good fight, and it's got a lot of technique in it. Both ladies are doing well at times. I think Lucy Berto overall is controlling the fight more, doing it a little bit better, and right now I have her winning. Well, there's her fiance, David. Looks a little bit like he might be reading the riot attack there. Knows maybe that she needs something special in this third and final round, but it is one of those fights that you could discuss in terms of the scoring. Well, yeah, you know, and he could look and say that he could believe that maybe she won the first round, but he knows she lost the second round, so he knows that she needs this to at least win the fight. Dora with those long levers, you just feel if she could settle into that range, she could do some damage, but that was a good shot from Berto. That was really nice, especially with the footwork of Berto to move herself out, come in, throw her shots, use your feet to circle out, reset, do it again. Sadora has that reach advantage that you highlighted, but we've barely seen her use it. And that's because she has. <laughs> it's real easy. She's been in the clinch position for a lot of this fight, now finding herself. She has lost the ability to win that clinch position every time that we've seen. When she's just initiated it, it's always been Lucy Berto who's ended up. Right? Nice little trip takedown, but Lucy Berto has been the one that's been able to do the best in that clinch work. The last time that Sadora got herself into this position, Bateau was able to really, really intelligently neutralize her. She's looking to do exactly the same thing here. Again, controlling that posture, going to, you know, it's, let's be honest, it's not the perfect mission control. It's not the way that she's being taught, but she is holding that leg with both hands, controlling that position, now going to a more conventional guard again. Again, trying to control position. But Sadura trying to do good work, trying to land elbows. We'll see what she can do as, again as far as damage. Yeah, remember if the mission at the start of this third and final round was for her to win the round, well, from that top position, if she can start to do damage, that would be her route to doing that. And right here, what Sadura wants to do is she wants to frame on that face. When you have someone that's trying to control your posture, you've got to make it uncomfortable for them. The way to do that is to frame out on them, make it to where it's painful for them to hold on to you. Going for the armbar. Looking for it here. Sadura's got her arm as far as it's held, but it's deep as far as what Lucy's got. And if she can separate those hands, she has a, the ability to possibly make this arm bar work. Just see, trying to work that position, trying to stretch it out here. I have a feeling that it's past the hip junction as far as it's not the right turn. When we talk about, you know, we're training kids and things like that, we're always telling you you're going to put that thumb up. Well, right now you want to put that thumb towards the cage fence to make this work, but you can't really see that she's got her hands in the right position. Oh, 
Heading towards the final 90 seconds here. You can see it now, she got it out. Nice job by Sadura, but still in a position. Lucy Berto can take the back here. You see that overhook is keeping Sadura where she's at. There you go. Lucy Berto has shown us tonight that that journey from boxer to MMA fighter is really progressing. Yeah, she is far more than a boxer now. Oh, good shot. She was a boxer there. <laughs> Straight left hand from Berto, good old fashioned combination. And she throws that left elbow, Berto. impressive isn't it when a fighter adapts to the situation and just finds a way and it, it feels like that's what Lucy Bateau has done here. Yeah what's really impressive is when you have someone that comes from a single style a single art form and then learns the other ones and brings it into their fighting style and wins the fight based upon those elements it's really special. Lucy Bateau punches the air she won against Maggie Bachel with her ground game here in October 2020. And it feels as if she's used that again to good effect here. And the journey continues for Lucy Berto. Of course, we wait for the decision here, but it was a good uh, all-round display that from Lucy Berto as we look back, John. Take a look at this flurry right here. Nice left hand over the top. You see Sidura coming with the wheel kick, trying to do something with it. But here was the takedown by Sidura. Very nice job, but again, wasn't able to do anything with the position. And then the arm bar attack occurred. She was stuck. This arm bar attack right here, Dave, this is a big difference in the round. And this is why the judges are going to end up with Lucy Berto winning this fight, winning that round. Even though she took some shots, you can see that by the damage on her forehead there. She had the big moments in the fight. She had the possible fight ending sequences that the judges are looking for. Well, we wait for Michael to get into position. Lucy Berto with an impressive display. Just felt like Sedora never really got going there, never was able quite to earn the right to, to fight the way she wanted to. Looks a little bit disappointed, maybe sees the uh, writing on the wall here in Paris, but... Uh, fighters know. Yeah, fighters know. I'll tell you one person who does know, Michael C. Williams, <laughs> let's get to him. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance, we'll go now to your three judges at cage side. Your first, Ben Cartledge, scores the fight 29 to 28. While judges Michael Murtha, David Torelli, both see it the same, 30 to 27. I'll have it for the winner by unanimous decision. Lucy Fireball-Berto. Lucy Berto gets the win. Huge smile on her face. And what a night we've already had. What a French night we've already had here in Paris. And of course, we've got quite a climax to the night coming up. The undisputed Bellator heavyweight world champion, Ryan Dunn. The heavyweight champion is a pinnacle of the sport. Oh, with the right hand, rocking Moldovsky! At the end of the day, I have the will to go out there and do whatever it takes to come out victorious. Mama oh, how sweet it is for Ryan Bader. And I'm going to have this heavyweight title wrapped around my waist when I'm walking out of that cage. It's that simple. 
The darkness is coming. Congo is a nightmare to fight. He can put the hurt on you. He just put Javier Ayala in airplane mode. My message to him is going to be, uh, uh, we have no mercy for that. Congo unloading a pentagon. The fight is a fight, but I will fuck you up. Just like that! Wow, you can feel the animosity coming out of your TV screen, can't you? We've got a, a stack main card as well as that heavyweight world championship between Vader and Congo. We've got Yoel Romero against Alex Belize. That's the one that everyone's been talking about, the potential fight of the night. Davy Galon, Le Normand is down here in Paris to fight Benjamin Brander. Lorenz Larkin against Kyle Stewart, who's going to throw everything at Larkin, but Larkin the strong favorite. Mike Shipman and Gregory Baben will get us underway. Should be terrific. The action, though, continues here tonight in the Accor Arena. We have the lightweights, Yves Londu and Gavin Hughes. And we can get them into the cage now. Let's get to Michael C. Williams. And now making his way to the cage, Gavin, the big tasty Hughes. Well, Gavin Hughes makes his first appearance in 19 months. There is a sense that the man from Liverpool needs to really get on a roll and start fulfilling his potential. There is plenty of that. Bellator signed him with great expectation. The return so far has been a win at Bellator Birmingham in May 2019. Then a loss last time against Danielis Gatizzi in Milan. Injuries have got in his way. He's not a man to make excuses. But when he's good, as he showed us against Mohamed Yaya on that Bellator debut, John, he is very, very good. When he's good, he's good. He just needs to get into a rhythm and fight his fight. With Skatizi, he got into, I'm better on the ground than you. Well, Skatizi's dangerous on the ground. You can get caught by making one mistake. You don't get into those situations. You look at your strength. You look at your opponent's weakness. In this fight right here, there is no doubt that he does have the better ground. But in the stand-up, He's fighting a very dangerous opponent, so how smart is Gavin Hughes going to be? Let's take a look at him at his best. Well, this was, you know, when Gavin gets the back, he is on, latched on, and he can do a lot of good work. The whole thing that he needs to do is never, ever get to the point where you're giving those positions away which he did with Skatizi. Here he gets that rear naked choke. It is latched on. It is tight. He just continues to cinch it down. That's called being a smart fighter, a good fighter, and that's what we need to see. And now set to make his way to the cage, Eve, you know. Feel that love here for Yves Landou. He's a fighter from a poor suburb of Paris who says that sport saved his life and says that the sport of mixed martial arts is now his focus. This is someone who is a break dancer of real significance, a BMX or a skateboarder. But Yves Landou's a dangerous fighter too. A veteran now of 25 fights, one and one in the Bellator cage and he wants to put on a show here in Paris. Let's see him soak up the acclaim here from his people.
Yeah, never, ever underestimate the dream come true factor of these homegrown fighters. Tough suburbs here to Bercy, quite a journey. And this was him against Terry Brazier. This was him against Brazier. I had just said, what Brazier needs to be careful of is Landu is explosive and whoa, comes with the flying knee. Look at this guy. That's the celebration. Anytime you can do a push-up off your elbow, you are a uh, very skilled and, and athletic individual. That's what we have at Eves Legend. We know that in the stand-up, he's explosive. He's got power. He comes after you. If you're looking at where this fight should go, if you want a chance at beating Eves, you want to take him to the ground. If you're Gavin, the ground will be your friend. But the question is, can you get it there? Don't often see a fighter enjoy and soak up a walk to the cage quite like that. He's savoring every single second of this Eve Landu. Ready to go, and big tasty Gavin Hughes staying loose and just waiting in that cage. Finally, Yves Londu is here, and again, they rise to him. Uh, if, you're, if you're Yves Landu, you gotta be loving this. Tail of the take then, the lightweights, Yves Londu and Gavin Hughes. And again, you point to that reach advantage. That's a four inch reach advantage, Dave. That is a big number. If you're Gavin Hughes, it's telling you, don't stand up with this man, try to get it to the ground. So Yves Londu, Gavin Hughes, let's make the introductions now. Michael C. Williams. Here at Accor Arena, Bellator MMA, glad to be back here in Paris for Bellator 280 as the prelims now get set for three five-minute rounds in the lightweight division. Introducing first, fighting out of the blue corner at 5'10", weighing in 155.2 pounds. His professional record, 10 wins, 2 losses, fighting out of Liverpool, England, Gavin Big Tasty Hughes. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot eight, weighing in 155.6 pounds as a professional. He holds 16 victories, nine losses, fighting out of Paris, France, presenting Yves United. And your referee in charge, Brian Miner. I think the crowd's kind of split on this one. <laughs> <laughs> it has got very full very quickly and a lot of these fans are here of course for Czech Congo later and Babin and Gallon but they're here to support this fella as well this is someone from this city Boy made good, and he hopes to make better here tonight. Yves Londu in those red gloves, and Gavin Hughes standing in his way, and Landu straight away with that acrobatic kick. That's what I'm talking about with the athleticism of Yves Landu. He is just unbelievably explosive, and he's got power. You got to figure for Landu, he was excited to fight here in Paris when. Bellator came the first time, but they only allowed a thousand people in the arena and he went crazy and what do you think he thinks of now with it packed? Good shot there from Hughes as Landu came in. Hughes using his low leg kicks. Full of energy is not Landu and they both look dangerous with their hands. Good shot again from Hughes. Well, the kick from Landu landed, except he was off balance and Hughes pushed forward. That's why he went back. He wasn't hurt by anything. Hughes is being very, very tight with his defense, and he needs to be, and that's smart.
And Hughes knows just where the Landu danger comes from. He's trying to deal with that and then earn the right to do what he does best. But what? good short right hook there from Landu. You are absolutely right. That right hook by Landu Land landed twice. Landu would be well served to split the guard of Gavin. Gavin tends his hands are tight when he's here, but as soon as he moves, he starts to separate them. That middle is open for Landu. But this is not bad for Gavin. In this position, he, I believe that he has the ability to use submissions. That beautiful job. Trying to reverse. He's got that wizard going right now. Back to their feet. Beautiful work by Gavin to get himself back to a position up top. And I think he burned a lot of energy out of Landu in all of that work. Yeah, Gavin Hughes has five wins by submission, four by guillotine. saw the knees to the body and you saw the reaction from Gavin and he started to just crunch down a little bit and do saw it went right back to the well the body shots will put anyone away there's nothing you can do when it lands clean big big time win for Yves Landu yeah that feels if you'll excuse the pun, like it bolts in somewhere, which you'll probably do in a moment anyway. We'll see the moves, I'm sure, but he's just made himself even more relevant here. Yves Landu, and it's the way he does it, too. He's fun to watch. Let's take a look at what happened here, because that knee to the body, you look at him, that hurt, you can see it. And then again, he starts to crush, he even starts to bring his leg, trying to bring his leg up. And then again with the knee, then the kick to the body, and he goes down. Beautiful job by Yves Landu. That was a good stop by Brian Miner. We'll see what Josh Thompson has to say about that one. But that man was hurt to the body, and only bad things were going to happen. Great, great win for Yves Landu. Yeah, we'll hear the views of Josh, who will, I'm sure, have something to say about all of that. But let's make Yves Landu's big night in Paris official. Well, Yves Landu soaks up the acclaim, but let's get to Michael C. Williams to make things official. Ladies and gentlemen, the official time, three minutes, one second round, number one, the winner by TKO, Yves, you know. What a win that is. Takes him to 17 and 9, and he enjoys everything that he does. He pointed to John <laughs> straight away, and John's now with him to catch up with Yves Landu. Well, I am here with the winner, Yves Landu. Yves, you came out here. You were super explosive. I know where you got that from, from your coach. But you went to the body, and the body paid off. How are you feeling right now in front of all your fans? Il a dit que que tu avais été super explosif sur, 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 sur tes attaques et que tu l'as touché plusieurs fois au corps et que ça ça a résulté avec euh, avec un chaos. Qu'est-ce que qu'est-ce qu'on pense? Uh, it's, it's my game plan for the fight. I'm very very happy to fight in Bellator Paris in France. Welcome to Paris Paris. La team elle est là. On est en France. On est en France. On représente la France. Y a rien du tout. C'est l'homme qui a peur, sinon il y a foi. Comme je dis à tout temps, toujours, à la base, je ne suis, suis pas un combattant, je suis un break dancer. Et là, on va montrer de quoi on est capable ce soir. Les... 
So it's just, it's just uh, super happy to be uh, doing that kind of performance here in France in front of his public. And he's, he doesn't come from fighting, he comes from hip hop, so he's gonna do a little demonstration. Look at this. All right, that's the second big time knockout. One with a flying knee, one with shots to the body. Who is it that he wants to fight here in this cage next? Because in Paris, he's unstoppable. Il a dit que tu as fait une super performance la dernière fois avec un coup de genou sauté. Et là, coup de genou au corps. Qui est que tu aimerais rencontrer la prochaine fois? Déjà, je suis vraiment, je suis vraiment sur euh, excité et sur, <rire> oh, j'ai perdu mes mots, sur, sur excité et vraiment motivé dix fois plus quand je combats à domicile. Vous l'avez, certains qui me connaissent, ils l'ont constaté. Maintenant, je pense que ça va être la dernière, euh, ma, mon dernier fight en moins de 70. Le, le prochain, je descends en moins de 66 pour être dans ma catégorie euh, avec mon poids respectif. Merci à vous. So, first of all, he's very excited, and uh, he's, uh, he was at a loss for words, but anyway, he's going to uh, drop a weight division because he feels like he's a, he's a small, uh, lightweight, and uh, he's going to do uh, even more, you know, crazy performances at a lighter weight. Well, I can't wait to see it. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for your man, the man you know, Eve Landu. Wasn't that something? Wasn't that something? A man who can just light up any room he's in. Not Josh Thompson, but Eve Landu. But talking of Josh Thompson, it's time that we got to the desk with him at Aiden. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, I think Josh has met his match tonight. He thought the sold-out arena, which is already full here in Paris, he thought it was for him. But no, many have come to see that man, and he has delivered. Josh, he is fun, there is no doubt about that. But he's ferocious, too, with those leg strikes. These guys are attacking me. I feel attacked right now. I, Look, I got your back. Please. Absolutely dominant performance, great performance. The knees did all the groundwork, finished it off with a kick. Great stoppage by the referee. Thought it was a wonderful job, great fight. Remember his name. Brilliant. Remember Eve Landu. Remember that name because he is just dynamite to watch. He's must-watch TV. So if you guys are watching this at home, make sure you guys follow him. Scores out of 10 for his dancing. <laughs> I would have broke my neck. Yeah, he's <laughs> he's going to try copy no. those moves later tonight here in Paris. No. There's no doubt about that. Well, two more European lightweights that are looking to make a statement tonight are another French favorite, and that is Davy Gallon and Benjamin Brander, who comes to us from Switzerland. Now, Brander knows tonight he is fighting not just Gallon, but this entire arena, which are making a lot of noise. He says Josh's motto for tonight is underdogs on top. So how does he come out on top against Gallon? Well, Brandon's got to put pressure on him, on Gallon. He's got to make sure he presses him to the fence, slows him down. Gallon's very good with his footwork. Gallon's very dynamic and explosive with his active movements. He'll he'll do things that Brandon will not be expecting. So he's got to make sure that he keeps his his defense tight as he's making that approach and sliding into that range to hit the striking in the boxing and utilize that wrestling and press. Uh, Galan to the fence. And we know Galan is a judo black belt. He's on a four-fight win streak. Two of those in his most recent fights have been here in Bellator, and they've been ultra-impressed with wins over Kane Musa. And last time out, it was against Charlie Leary. We know he's good on the ground, but of recent, we are seeing he's very good on the feet as well. He's a dynamic fighter. He's someone that could take this fight everywhere. He's a true mixed martial artist. Now, look, when you, t when you look at the things that he can do really well, is that he utilizes his footwork, and he waits for you to slide in and make a mistake, and he hits Leary with a beautiful left hook, sent him to the canvas. But he was having his way with Leary at the time. Leary is someone that will walk you down, put pressure on you, make you fight his fight, try to make you tired by taking shots. In that fight, he just touched him, boom, nicely done, finished it up. He is someone that's dynamic and expect for him to do things that you've never seen before in the cage. Those are the type of fighters that are fun to watch. Well, he's also got to deal with a three-inch height and indeed three-inch reach advantage that Brander has. That's going to pose its own set of problems. Yeah, absolutely. The reach and the height advantage it does, but with Galan, Galan's so good with his footwork, he'll slide in and out, and do not underestimate his wrestling and his grappling and his judo, because his attacks come quick and they come fast. All right, now, more lightweight action here in Paris, because we have an Anglo-slash-Viking invasion taking center stage. 
We do indeed. I tell you, the place is still buzzing after Yves Landu. That was something else. What a night it's been. But now, Soren back and Charlie Leary are going to get it on at a contract weight here. And let's head back to Michael. And now ready to make his way to the Bellator cage. This is Charlie 917 Leary. Well, Charlie Leary has always given the impression that he'll take on any challenge. And after Saul Rogers was injured, the man from Watford proved that by coming into face Soren back, goodness me, he will take on the challenge. He's still stung by that Dublin defeat that we saw against Davy Gallon. He's a dangerous fighter with a great right hand and better jiu-jitsu than he's given credit for. But he faces a massive challenge here tonight. And the man they call 917 is going to need all of his legendary strength and spirit here, John. See, I hate to say this because it doesn't sound nice but it is the truth and it is an absolute compliment charlie leary is a zombie he just keeps coming after you he keeps coming forward you talk about your worst nightmare you're talking about the guy in the bar that you hit him with the bar stool and he laughs at you and comes after you that's charlie leary there is no give up in this man at all he keeps coming forward and he then puts shots on you wears you down he has beat some outstanding fighters in MMA. He's going to have his hands full of Soren Buck and the grappling. But like you said, he's got good jujitsu and he can make, he can get that catch. That's all it takes is one air. It would be some win if he could pull this off tonight for Charlie Leary. And now his opponent, Soren, the true Viking. Here's another showman. Fresh from his new experience fighting in the USA for the first time, winning against Bobby Lee. Soren backs 2-0 in the Bellator cage, a seven-fight win streak, as you can see. But he knows that now is the time to start finding a way to finish his opponents. He's built up an impressive record of formidable reputation. He's looked great, but he knows that in this combat world, it's not just about winning, it's about impressing, entertaining, ultimately dazzling. He has the skills, he's improving all the time, but will tonight be the start of a new Soren back? It would open up even more doors for him if he could start getting people out of there. You said it all. It, it, there's two elements to fighting. There's the sporting element, and then there's the entertainment element. You see as Soren Bach comes in here, and he's got the whole thing with the Viking, and it's beautiful to see. The skill set of this man is impressive. We're talking about a guy that has dominated fighters, fighters like Patty Pivlet. I mean, just destroyed him in their fight. This is against Bobby Lee, and you see what he does. But the one thing we need to see out of Soren Bach, we need to see finishes because people want to see finishes. They don't care that you just dominate someone. They don't care that at times you pick them up and drop them down. They want you to finish them, and that's what Soren Bach is looking for tonight. He's fired up, and he's ready to go here. Soren Bach is in Paris, and he's in the cage, and he's looking for that finish. Well, the Vikings did come to Paris, right? <laughs> they did. The tail of the tape at a contract weight of 160. Surin back and Charlie Leary, and you want to have a look at that age and those records. The, the real simple thing is here, look at it. 29 years of age, Surin back is just entering the highlight of his career. 39 years of age for Charlie Leary. He's getting on the age, so old side of it. 15 and one, that shows you how good Soren Bach is. It's highlight against twilight. Let's get to Michael C. Williams. Here in Paris, we welcome those back in the States that are streaming live on YouTube at Bellator, MMA, and Showtime Sports channels. Here at Bellator 280, the prelims roll on now with three five-minute rounds at a contract weight of 160 pounds. Introducing the blue corner at six foot weighing in 160 pounds even. His professional record, 17 wins, 12 losses, one draw. He fights out of Watford, England, Charlie 917. 
Curry. And across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at five foot nine, weighing in 159 pounds as a professional. He's near perfect at 15 and one, fighting out of Copenhagen, Denmark, presenting Soren, the true Viking Bach. And the referee in charge, Brian Miner. So Soren Beck is someone who's been wrestling since he was six years of age, comes from a very small village in Denmark. His cousins went wrestling, so he went as well, and it's turned out pretty well for him, former Danish youth wrestling champion. He wants this on the ground. He says that Charlie Leary's takedown defense is weak. Well, he's going to find out shortly. Using one punch to set up his entry on that takedown. And this right here is usually where Soren Bach just excels. When he gets into the clinch, he just starts lighting people up. Knees, big shots. Charlie Leary is not going to go anywhere. He is going to be in the middle of Soren Bach's face the entire fight. Like I said, he just keeps coming forward. Sorenbach acknowledged that. He said he's got great respect for Charlie Leary. He doesn't expect to get him out of there easily. And Leary coming forward and landing that right hand. Looking for those knees up close, Sorenbach. Pushing Leary back to that cage, trying to find an opening here. And as you say, at the moment, the man you call the zombie isn't going anywhere. Oh, he's not going to. He's going to come forward. Sorenbach reminds me of an ex-Bellator champion, a guy that was an Olympian, Ben Askren. Not many people can do well in MMA with one skill set. Ben Askren was one of those guys. Soren Bach is the exact thing. He's one of those guys. He lives and dies on his wrestling. But he needs to be able to get inside and get his hands on you. And Charlie Leary's doing a great job so far. Nice job of rolling through by Charlie Leary being able to come out in the top position. That was a nice head and arm toss by Soren Bach. Charlie went with it. And by going with it, that's why he was able to end up in the top position. Yeah, Leary started just about as well as he could have done here. He also bloodied the nose of Sorenbach when they were on their feet. Back able to get back to his feet, reset, and start again. See, it's straight punches right now. Charlie Leary, everything you throw should be a straight punch. Right down the middle, make it to where he has to end up trying to come under or anything like that which is going to open up knees for you don't start throwing wide charlie's going to go for a ride here you see soren's hands locked around he does have his one arm but there's the ability to fight off but he's got those arms locked it's not an easy position for charlie to defend with doing his best here to try and get himself back into the position he wants to be and he's done that but he knows he needs to do some damage when they're on their feet here charlie's been very patient been trying to pick his spots this is what a veteran fighter does don't get all amped up and try to get rid of this guy fast it's, that's not going to probably happen so let me just do the right things that can allow me to continue to put shots on you. And not so far, Charlie's done a good job of that. He's 
doing really well here, Leary. Again, excellent defence. And it's been fascinating to watch him use that jab, soak up a couple of shots or two, but throw back with plenty of his own. Look for the uppercut, then that right hand. That's a really good shot from Leary. And all of those shots, every one of them, Dave, all straight up the middle. He's not throwing wide, and that's making him very successful here. Well, this opening round has not gone the way that many experts were predicting it. It's gone exactly like Charlie Leary predicted it. Suddenly, things got a whole lot more interesting in this fight, I think, because Charlie Leary did the perfect job just about in that opening round, didn't he? Charlie Leary was great. You look at him, calm, relaxed, didn't press too much, threw straight shots down the middle, made it to where Soren Bach had to try to get past those straight shots. It wasn't easy for him, and when he knew that he was going, instead of trying to fight through it, went with it and came out on top. There you go with the straight shots. Beautiful uppercut, throws the straight shots down the middle. He's got Soren Bach in a position where he's backing up. Really nice round by Charlie Leary. Mixing up of the work's good as well, isn't it? Because in a way that the uppercut earns him the right to throw that straight right hand and, and catch Soren back. <laughs> round two between the true Viking. Soren back in those... Red gloves here against Charlie Leary, who did a really good job in that opening round. Largely keeping it on the feet and certainly doing some damage on the feet. Now, Soren Bach in this round, because of what Charlie Leary has shown him with all those straight shots, he needs to use lateral movement. Throw the feint, wait for that shot, throw, hit your lateral movement, and then come in at the angle to use your hands to get into your wrestling. See, right there, straight into Charlie Leary. That's not a way to get Charlie to the ground. Charlie's too good. He's been around too long. He understands how to stop that type of takedown attempt. Just stonewalled it. Leary again, sticking to his work, that nice measured calmness that John was talking about, picking his shots and not getting carried away. Use that jab again well there. When they trade like that, there's only one winner here when they're on their feet. Leary carries real power in that right hand, and he's really accurate with that jab as well. He's been very accurate with it. See, there, Charlie, getting that underhook. That's making it difficult for Soren to get that takedown. Everything he's doing right now is working for him. It's not... Not in a position where, oh, he's winning every second of the round. Obviously, Soren Box got him in a position where he would not want to be against the cage. But he's still fighting well, and he is understanding exactly what he needs to do to stop what Soren Bach is attacking. Soren Bach, that one defeat back in uh, October 2016 in Finland when he was stopped after 82 seconds by Alexei Mentikivi. But since then, seven consecutive wins, including that victory against Paddy Pimblett. Burgeoning reputation, a sense that needs to start getting people out of there, but it feels here like there's plenty of time to turn this round, but he's in a bit of trouble here. Things aren't going his way. And Charlie Leary again, combination. Look, look at how square Soren Bach is. There's no blade to his body at all. He is coming in just flat, which is allowing Charlie just to tee off on him. Again, blood to that nose. Leary is so accurate. Look at that jab again. Just spears into the nose of Soren back, and he can throw those hopeful hooks all night. Danger signals there for Leary, but again, excellent takedown defense. And that nose is damaged now. Yes, it is. 
And now Soren Bach isn't being able to breathe out of the nose. The mouth is opening up. That is what Charlie Leary needs to be careful of. That look that Soren Bach is coming in for the takedown instead, the overhand right or the big looping left. When Leary makes him miss, he punishes him. That's what a good fighter does, man. Make your opponent pay for coming inside. It'll make them think twice about doing it again. They do it again, just repay them in the same fashion. Right now, Soren Bach with a two on one. Let's go over to try to land some shots. Most of these exchanges, though, he's not winning. He is the guy that is coming out second best. And when you're watching this, never underestimate. These might not be hugely, obviously powerful shots that are knocking Surin back over, but they are gradually taking so much out of him, and you can see how heavily he's starting to breathe here. Yeah, we talk about it all the time. Volume attacks, and that's what Charlie Leary has. It's a volume attack, but as long as you're not being hurt, that volume attack it's going to wear your opponent out. Fight number 31 for Charlie Leary, and he feels like he's using every single second of that experience here. Who said his takedown defense was bad? Another right hand from Leary to finish round two. See the way Surin back went. Back over to the far side of the cage there, unsteady on his feet. Charlie Leary has got himself into a great position here, John. He's put himself in a position to definitely win this fight. Right now, I have him up 2-0. Oh, here comes Leary. You see Bach trying to go for the takedown. Leary just picks him up. Beautiful lead uppercut with the left. Straight shots down the middle. Bach comes back into him. Bach has not been successful in getting Charlie Leary on his back. David Lee, who Charlie Leary says, always has been and always will be his head coach. The talented young footballer, Charlie Leary, was on the books at Watford, his hometown club, but was injured playing football, and that's what got him into this sport, and it's it's going pretty well for him. <laughs> the age of 39. He takes his licks, but he comes back from the great win against Kiefer Crosby, hugely dramatic one, and then desperately disappointed against Davy Gallant. But if he could pull this off, well, that really would be something. Yeah, this might be the biggest win of Charlie Leary's career if he gets this win against Soren Bach at 15 and 1. And let's be honest, we were all talking about Soren Bach needing to find a way to finish and not just win by decision. Well, at the moment, he needs to find a way to win. Well, this is how Soren Bach does it. When he gets on in the top position, he's able to use a lot of technique, a lot of good ground skills to dominate his opponent, do a lot of ground and pound work. He's not the guy that's the great submission fighter, though. He does, he's not the one that's you know, setting up the slick arm bars and things like that. He's more of that just grinder, putting a lot of pressure and just beating you down. Seven wins via submission for Surin back, but his last four wins have all come via decision. This is where Soren Bach does his best work, though. He gets top position, side control, half guard, which he's in now. These are all places where he's super comfortable. It's hard to move him. He's got great hip pressure. You see Charlie trying to push him away. Not going to happen. We still got, as you can see, as we all know, over three minutes and counting remaining. 
see the blood coming from the nose there of Soren Back. But the question is, does Back need a finish here? If you have it, first two rounds to Leary. He needs to do more than just exist in this position, John. If he wants a win, in my opinion, he needs to finish Charlie Leary. If he wants a draw, he needs to do more and damage Charlie Leary to get a 10-8 round, which is going to be difficult for him to do. He can do it. There's half the round left. Leary doing everything he can here to defend. Holding on to that right hand of Soren back. And, you know, we talked about Charlie and having an underrated ground attack and that he's good off of his back. And that's what you're seeing. I mean, all the things that are happening here, he's fighting real smart. You see the underhook on the far side. That's smart for him to do. As soon as Box settles down, he brings it back to protect himself. Although Bach is in the top position, he's not doing a lot of damage right now to Charlie Leary. And deep down, Charlie Leary will always have known that at some point he would be in this position. I think so he'll have so. had a game plan. I think so. Going into the fight, knowing Soren Bach, he figured, you know, I'm going to end up on my back. My big thing is I need, don't extend anything out, don't give him anything, and just calmly and selectively just defend yourself to the point where you can either get back to your feet or the round's going to end. The task is suddenly not quite as big for Leary. 90 seconds remaining. Surely Soren back needs a submission win here. Surely he needs to finish Leary. You can never be sure. And that feels like the logical way to look at it. No, you never know exactly which way the judges went, but common sense would tell you that right now Charlie Leary should be up in this fight. He's going to lose this round, but Soren Bach needs to really get after him and do something special here with less than a minute. Leary will be, well, they'll both be aware that that clock is ticking now. We wanted urgency from Soren Berg. He said he'd been soul searching about not finding a finish. Is he going to dramatically find one here in the final 30 seconds? Now he starts to open up. Now he gets the back of Leary. Leary desperately trying to cling on. So the action, that was a good move for Charlie Leary to give the back. Don't take the shots from the mount. Now just protect your neck. Final 10 seconds back. Surely needs the finish here. He's looking for that rear naked, but Charlie Leary defending here for his life and maybe for the win. Now it goes to the judges, but what an intriguing slow burner of a fight that was. that takedown by Soren Bach. Nice job trapping that leg. Getting Charlie Leary down with his back on the mat. And from there, did a lot of good work. Just not enough to get the finish. And it not doesn't enough. get much more dramatic than that at the no, end, and, does it? And a lot of people are going to look and say, is this a 10-8 round? And I'm going to tell you right now, the way they're scoring, this isn't going to be a 10-8 round. It's going to be a 10-9. And I see Charlie Leary getting a 29-28 victory. And Charlie Leary has felt a few times that the scorecards have been unkind to him. Lost six times by decision. That fight against Tim Wilde, he said he made a tactical mistake when he coasted in the final round and thought that he was unfortunate to lose that. Will fortune favor him here? Certainly feels like he's earned it. And as you've already said, this would be a massive win for him. It's a huge win. When you look at, you know, the, the differences in age, where they are in their careers, the record of Sorenbach, who he has competed against and who he has beaten, Charlie Leary, this is a big, big win.
no, no back ref of this fight? Yes. Ref to the Leary back fight. Well, they stand and smile, and that's one of the wonderful things about combat sports. And the length of time this has taken <laughs> makes me think Never it's going to get interesting. Good. Yeah, exactly. Do we have a split coming? Well, we shall see. Well, Soren Back has got the uh, the Viking costume ready. Let's get now to Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll go now to your three judges at cage side. Your first judge, Michael Murtha, scores at 29-28, while judges, or, excuse me, next judge, Dave Torelli, 30-27, and your third judge, Sal Damata, 29-28, all have it for the winner by unanimous decision, Soren, the true Viking. Well, I honestly don't know what to say. I don't agree with it. One of those cards was 30-27. Unbelievable. And I honestly don't know what to say. Charlie Leary feels that he's had bad luck in the past. Well, that's beyond bad luck, isn't it? That just feels desperately, desperately unfortunate for Charlie Leary. Anyway, I'm sure the guys at the fight desk, as Sorenbach celebrates, will have plenty to say about that. It was a unanimous decision, but it went the way of Sir and Back. Over to you, Josh and Aiden. Josh, are you as puzzled to make some sense of that scoring? No, I allow Big John to make those calls, and I gotta, for once in my life, agree with Big John. Yeah, I, I completely agree with the fact that I thought Leary won the fight. He won the first two rounds, he lost the third, obviously, and uh, they just got it wrong. All right, well, commiserations to Charlie Leary. Congratulations to Soren Back. We have a five-fight fight main card coming to you live from Paris. It starts at 4 o'clock Eastern on Showtime. If you're tuning in, by the way, from the UK, you can catch it on BBC Three at 9 p.m. British Standard Time. The heavyweight champion, Ryan Bader, is in enemy territory to settle a score and faces nemesis Czech Congo in a world championship rematch that has been brewing for three years and is about to boil over. Also tonight, in a sold-out Acor Arena, Lawrence Lorenz, Monsoon Larkin competes once again at middleweight and the welterweight veteran welcomes former Marine veteran Kyle guns up Stewart to the promotion Josh we expected to see Larkin return to 170 where he's defeated some of the very best in all of MMA but I guess when you beat the former middleweight champion in Rafael Carvalho maybe a run at 185 makes sense no, it doesn't make any sense at all. He understands that. His body frame and things like that are just not at the at where they need to be to fight at 185. But he has not been active, so he's like, look, I'm not going to torture myself to get my weight down, keep my weight down. So he understands, I'm going to get this win, come out here, or he's looking to get the win, I should say. He's looking to get the, a win against Stewart. And if he does that, he's like, I'm going to definitely go back down to 170. Okay, and for Kyle Stewart, he said it himself many times all this week, this is a huge opportunity on his promotional debut in Bellator MMA. And Lorenz Larkin acknowledged that fact he said he is a very dangerous fighter because he has nothing to lose so as well as it being a, a free hit what else is guns up packing tonight Lorenz all he's got to do is just use his footwork okay Stewart though he needs to make sure he slows him down by doing that so he needs to press him to the fence bring him to the ground try to trap him you know what basically when you see Rocky chasing the chickens that's what you're going to be seeing tonight. You're going to see Stewart trying to press him to the fence, get the takedown, make him carry the weight. All right, we'll have to see if he can catch that chicken. Now, fisting fireworks at Featherweight. <laughs> Easy for you to say, Aiden. Thanks very much indeed. Jordan Barton and Fabakari Diata. This is a bit of a slow burn. It's one that people have been talking about a lot. Let's get now to Michael. And now making his way to the cage, Jordan. Well, Jordan Barton was involved in a sensational fight last time against Kieran Clark in Dublin. One, though, that eats away at him because he believes that he should have won it. Clark came back from adversity that night and was rightly praised to the heavens. But the other side to that story was Barton's sense that he made mistakes, he made the wrong decisions, and it cost him what would have been a massive win. He gets the chance against another really difficult opponent to put things right tonight. Jordan, Bar Jordan Barton showed in that fight that, man, he's good. And he had Kieran Clark down on the cards. He was winning that fight. 
got into the third round, made a mistake, and ended up losing to that rear naked choke. But we saw that this guy can fight. He's good. He's going to have a big opportunity tonight because the guy he's fighting is undefeated and just dog tough. So nothing's getting easier for Jordan. And now set to make his way to the cage, Fabakati Jet. Potentially as he heads the bantamweight. He comes here with eight wins out of eight, spread out over six years. Two dominant decision wins in the Bellator cage. It's a fighter going places, as you probably can tell from the love he's getting here. He's one that grew up in these tough Parisian suburbs that could be near the beginning of an exciting journey. He starts to move up the levels and find out just how good he is. Absolutely, that's exactly what he's doing. It, but so far with the people they have put in front of him he has shown first off he is tough second incredibly strong for the weight class durable and, and for a guy coming out of france since we don't see a lot we see a lot of great strikers we don't see a lot of great grapplers this guy can wrestle this guy will somewhere during this fight jordan bart is going on air diata because he's gonna go for a ride. It's just part of what Diata does, and that makes him fun to watch. Talks inspiringly about his art. Says he wants to surpass himself every day. A constant journey of improvement. Part of it, this win against Nathan Rose. And look, Nathan Rose, very good technical stand-up fighter. And Diana just stood in the pocket with him. No problems. Kicks, punches, and at times decided, oh, you're going to go for a ride. Picks him up and dumps him down. He does it to everybody that is just part of who Babakari Diata is. the featherweights as Fabakari Diata takes on Jordan Barton and look no further than those records. And that's it, both young fighters, but 8-0 for Giada. This kid is going places. He is tough, he is good, and he does not believe that anyone can beat him. Let's get now to Michael C. Williams. Tonight here at Accor Arena, Bellator MMA presents a special feature set for three five-minute rounds in the featherweight division. And now, first introducing the blue corner. At 5'10", weighing in 145.2 pounds, his professional record, six wins, two losses, one draw, fighting out of Manchester, England, Jordan Barton. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot nine, weighing in 145 pounds, even unbeaten inside the Bellator cage as an undefeated overall professional. He enters at eight and oh, he's fighting out of Paris, France, introducing Babadakari Jetta. In charge, your referee, Mike Beltran.
This could be explosive. Jordan Barton in those blue gloves, the man from Manchester, the Mancunian, up against this Parisian Fabakari Diata. Good early work there from Barton. Caught him with a, a right hand. It didn't really sting him, but good start from the taller man. I like what I'm seeing out of Jordan Barton. Look as he's coming forward. He's looking for that counter. As soon as Yada starts to move, little step back, lets the shot go by, tries to come with the counter. Nice and tight so far. Jordan Barton. Oh, that was a slick little uppercut by Yada. The crowd getting behind the local man here. Diata, Diata. Look for that left uppercut again. Both of them already using those low kicks. Diata really stinging with them. We already see the reddening on the outside of that left thigh of Jordan Barton and the inside. to the body there, left and right hooks. Beautiful work by Jordan Martin going down low, came back up high, second shot, third shot, right back to the body. Faints with those kicks up the middle there from Barton as well. These are two highly skilled fighters. And then that body kick from Diata. Talked about not using that enough against Rose. He's been working hard on that. Nice stiff jab by Jordan Barton. say that styles make fights and there's a really interesting contrast between the two stylistically here that's a great move by Jordan Barton just putting it in the mind of Giada that you know what I will take you down too I'm not gonna just sit here and be a kickboxer I'm gonna be an MMA fighter I'm gonna make you have to think about the possibility of me putting you on the canvas when he talked after that Kieran Clark fight Jordan Barton saying decision-making is king and he's made some pretty good ones here this is why we talk about fight IQ all the time because the smart fighters make good decisions that put them in a position to win the fight very nice job it's hard to see but Jordan Martin had that leg the arm laced on the right side that was keeping Diata from being able to turn it and he used that as that let go, he tried to move them out for it. He ended up in half guard, but it was a really slick move. He's trying to get back to his feet, trying to make a mistake as he did so, and the crowd respond to that. Job of framing. Good job of the elbow on the exit by Giada. Both guys really fighting smart, calculated. Jordan Barton is fighting as good as I've ever seen him fight right now. And it's been an outstanding opening round here from both of them so far. There was some who wondered if Barton could cope with Diata, but he's coping all right. Coping well, and he's he's got he's got Fabakari in the position where Fabakari's guessing. That's never a good position. That's not good for you. That means that the other guy is leading that dance, and that's why Jordan Barton is doing well right now. Watching the end here of this opening round. One of those that. 
be a hard one to score. They've both done good work in there. Jordan Barton, like he did against Kieran Clark, has started well here. Started very well. That was a good, clean round for Jordan Barton. Well, they're packed in here already. Passionate about this sport here in Paris. Here's some of the good work of Diata John. And beautiful combination, ending with the kicks, hiding that kick behind the hands, and then that was the exit when he had him up against the cage. Make the, if you're gonna have and release on that cage, make your opponent pay for it. Get that shot on the exit, that's exactly what he did. crowd here to support Fabakari Diata. They've had a lot to cheer so far with the French fighters. They've got Baben and Galon, of course Congo to come. But Jordan Barton has started really well here against the local hero. And you can tell just by the way he came out in the second round how Jordan Barton is feeling about how he's doing in this fight right now. Good head movement as well from Barton. Yeah. Right on cue, he gets tagged. That's it. <laughs> it's always when you say it. That smart move. Take him down, let your head clear out. Even if you don't get in there, good job of kicking the leg. Now he's got the hook, both hooks. Barton's in a great spot right here. He's making Giada carry that weight. So impressed with how proactive Barton has been. He's trying to make things happen in that. He's not only trying, he's making things happen. You're absolutely right. Now he's got that. Oh, he's getting close. Barton's really close here. He's in trouble. He's in trouble. I don't care how he twists. He had to desperately try to stay. a gamer no one wants their head I look at that and that's just horrible with the way my neck is Giada just tough right right back to the guillotine well, Barton looking for that guillotine how close is he don't think he's that close with it the crowd will tell you The real question now is how much did that take out of Jordan Barton's arms? How heavy are they? The lactic acid buildup and squeezing hard. Giada trying to get a little bit of air after those two choke attempts. You weren't breathing for part of this fight. That is not an easy thing to do. Carrying Good. Barton's weight as well for as long as he did. Nice clean body shot with the right hand by Barton to the body. Giada coming forward now. There's certainly more cleanness in Barton's work. There's good volume from Diata in the stand-up. Really clever some of this from Barton because he's landing his jab and he's making Diata pay for that lazy left hand. Diata with it. Cut left hook, great combination. Good stuff, this John. Well, wow, just fantastic. I'm sitting here with my mouth open, just watching. It's just so clean. What Giada's doing. Martin going for the flying knee. Well, well timed as far as Giada getting a hold of him. He saw it coming. Puts him back to onto the canvas. Listen to the swell of that crowd. Every time Diata 
does something effective. You got to think of all the things that Jordan Martin did. You don't want to lose this round by staying on your back right here and letting Giada steal this round because he had some good submission attempts. He's going after another one here, looking for the arm. Giada sees it, he's trying to hold it, but now martin has got it. He's in place. He just needs to engage those hips and get those hands of Giada separated. Let go of it. Trying to isolate that limb, and he just couldn't quite get it. He was looking for that beautiful sweep. He almost, he had his hips light for a second. Wasn't able to carry it through. Final 20 seconds in a round that might still be up for grabs here. Absolutely, by both guys. You know everyone at home and the fella sitting next to you is wondering how you're scoring it. <laughs> I want you to think back. Jordan Barton had Giada in a choke that I'm surprised he got out of. Okay, let's take a look at that real quick. Because when he latched on here, he gets his arm behind. He goes with... That palm to palm. Take a look at Giada's head. It is looking straight up at the top of the arena here. That is tight. There's a lot of pressure right there. His head is not in the position we want to see, but he gets himself out. I mean, it was re a remarkable job of staying composed Ladies by and Giada. Put your hands together as we and go to the third and Giada final goes round. into the guillotine. The takedown was nice, but not enough, in my opinion, if the judges remember what happened to get the round, I give it to Barton. So still up for grabs. It's been high level in there. These are two fighters who rightly can have big ambitions. there from Barton wasn't too well, far away from landing clean. Giada really putting a lot of steam on these shots now though. That jab's coming out quick. Here he goes for the takedown. Good escape though from Barton. Well, Jordan Barton's been here before in an arena that's passionately supporting his opponent. Ahead in the fight, arguably doing well. Is he going to make the right decisions in this third and final round? He's got a chance to put it right as he said he oh! wanted to. Left hook from Barton. <laughs> the left hook was beautiful. The, the thought of the fly knee was okay, but don't get caught in that space where now Giada can get a hold of you. You got him hurt, still. Nearly landed with that right cross. Lemtiata back onto the jab. And they're both starting to swing now. Both making each other miss. And that short elbow from Giata. Giata needs to be careful with his neck. Nice job of Jordan Barton to come around. Notice the arm lace here with the right arm. Those elbows 
was there from Barton. There's so much method and thought in what he's doing here. He is just fighting a very intelligent fight. You saw certain things. You saw when he was in the position, the head control. That was keeping Fabricari from being able to get himself up. Everything he's doing, the hip ride. Nice job by Gianna to get himself up. Brings him right back down. And you look at that, that is demoralizing when you're Fabricari because you're working hard to get yourself back up. You get yourself to your feet, and all of a sudden you're being returned to the mat. He's using those knees really well, Barton. Man, that's a Charlie horse on the thigh, especially someone that's as muscled as Gianna. It has an effect. He wanted to prove that he learned the lessons from Dublin. And at the moment, it feels like he has. Final minute of what has been an outstanding fight. And they both come out of this with big reputations, however it ends. Beautiful exit by Barton with that elbow. Giada really needs to open up, go after him. Oh, right elbow there from Giata, then the flying knee from Barton didn't land, but Giata senses that he needs something spectacular. Nice job by Barton. Use his hands, get to that clinch position. Now looking for his takedown. Barton done enough here. I believe he has. Barton turns and celebrates and thinks he's done enough. But we've learned already tonight not to prejudge anything. So suffice to say, you have him winning. Look, there's no way in the world you can tell me that Jordan Barton didn't win that fight. Take a look, just take a look at the body language of both fighters right now. They know who won that fight. I'm saying nothing. <laughs> I'm waiting till Michael reads out the scores, but however it ends, it was a great watch. Here's some of the best action from it, John. Some great action. Look at that left hook. And again, see, this is what people don't remember. They don't remember in the third round, Barton hurt Giada badly with that left hook and just overall had the clean shots. Remember the body attacks when he went one to the body, up high, back down to the body. Just fought a beautiful exhibition overall. You talk about a guy coming off of a loss, learning things off of that loss, and then putting on a great performance. Jordan Barton put on an unbelievable one. Well, we're still waiting. For Michael C. Williams. Which is bad news for me. <laughs> Which always makes you wonder. And the two fighters stand in the center of the cage. Pleased for Jordan Barton that he was felt the agony of that defeat by Kieran Clark and felt that he made mistakes and let himself down and was desperate, I think, to show the work that he'd done and the, the mental work as well to learn how to make the right decision and, and he did show us that didn't he and you're always pleased when that happens for a fighter absolutely whether or not it's got in the win we're going to find out very very shortly michael is back in the cage call the fighters to the center and we can hand now to michael c williams to find out Ladies and gentlemen, we'll go now to your three judges for your decision. Your first judge, Michael Bell, scores the fight 29-28. He sees the fight for Barton. Your second judge, Michael Murtha, 29-28. He scores the fight for Zieta. 
Your third and final judge at cage side, Sal D'Amato, scores the fight 29 to 28 for the winner by split decision, Jordan Barton. Barton gets the win. Barton puts it right via a split decision. Great atmosphere in here, but it's gone wrong for the first time. Let's get back up to eight. Thank you, Dave. We are inching ever closer to our main card here at Bellator Paris, and we kick it off tonight with London Shoot Fighters standout middleweight. Mike Sebastian Shipman returns to the Bellator cage. He is in enemy territory tonight to take on French submission specialist Gregory Baben. It's great to see Mike Shipman back in the cage. Josh, he has re-emerged from the pandemic with a newfound love for the sport. So what improvements has that helped him uh, make to an already impressive skill set? We know about the power and the pressure. Yeah, we're just going to find out what improvements he's made. I can't tell you because I haven't seen him yet. And that's the point of tonight. So what he's going to do, he said, look, there's a lot of things that I've changed on and worked on over the year, year and a half that I've been away because of the pandemic. He's like looking forward to showing all of his new skill sets. And I think it's going to be dynamic because he's a great wrestler. He's got good stand up. And he pushes a pace. And Gregory Baben, we know he's won his last eight fights by submission. So how careful does Shipman have to be to not make a mistake and leave that neck hanging out? I think in terms of the wrestling aspect, he's got to be careful leaving his neck out and, and getting those takedowns. If he goes in there, shoots on the double leg, hits the transition, he's got to make sure he's passing guard so he doesn't get caught in that guillotine. Okay, and then when he gets to those positions, he wants to avoid being directly in the guard. Some fighters are really good in the guard position from the neck to the triangles to the arm bars. If he can get past in a half guard or get into side control, I think he's got a good chance of winning. All right, we shall see. It is time for our penultimate prelim. Thanks, Aiden. Thibaut Guti and Lewis Long get it on now, and we can get them into the cage. Here's Michael C. Williams. And now making his way to the cage, Thibaut GT Guti. So Thibaut Guti, at the age now of 35, brings real experience and a solid record all the way from Aix-en-Provence down in the south of France. He's fought at a high level. He's found the air there a little tougher in which to breathe since losing to Nasrat Hakparast in October 2018. He's done well domestically, winning three in a row on French fight nights. And now with that confidence behind him, he's ready to test himself in that more rarefied air once again. Dangerous fighter, this fellow. Very dangerous. Very good at the stand-up and has good ground. And now to make his way, Lewis the Foot Long. Well, Lewis Long is one of the great characters in an MMA world which is full of great characters. But there's a strong argument to say as well that he's an underrated fighter. Apart from his dramatic defeat against Oliver Encamp in Dublin in February 2020, he has four wins in his last fight. He seems to get better with every fight. And he produced a moment of technical and brutal brilliance when he beat Michael Dubois in London last October. To use his words, he says that we can expect a mad Welshman trying to take someone's head off. But in reality, we can expect someone a lot lot smarter than that don't believe the image this is a very very clever fighter the tail of the tape the welterweights here lewis long the welshman thibaut guti the frenchman and you want to take a look at that reach advantage well at 73 inches thibaut guti's got very good stand-up skills and he needs to keep lewis long at that range the question is can he do it let's find out let's get to michael c williams for all those that have just joined on live in the UK on BBC iPlayer, we welcome you to the Bellator 280 prelims here in Paris as we go now to three five-minute rounds in the welterweight division. Introducing first the blue corner at 5'10", weighing in 170.8 pounds. His professional record, 15 wins, 5 losses from Aix-en-Provence, France presenting GT Thibault. Gucci. 
And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot ten, weighing in 170.8 pounds as a professional. 19 victories, six defeats from Pontypridd, Ronda Kidrumtav, Wales. Introducing Lewis the Foot Long, and your ref in charge, Brian Miner. So Lewis Long in those red gloves. Thibaut Guti comes out firing. Lewis Long, 12 wins via submission. Expert on the ground. There's no question where he wants this fight. Well, there's no question that Guti just gave him an opportunity. Luckily, he made it out of that. But Lewis Long does want this fight to the ground. He has got an exceptional submission game. The question is, can he get in on Goody to get this fight there without absorbing damage that ends the fight? Goody, 15 wins, six of those by KO or TKO. Lewis Long was so bruised and broken by that defeat in Dublin against Oliver Rencamp. Dramatic spinning elbow. And vowed never to make a mistake like that again. And took a right hand there from Guti. So far, Guti blocking those kicks from Lewis Long, trying to unload himself here. Guti has been able to find that range with that right hand, and Lewis Long keeps dropping his left hand just a little bit. Every time he drops it down, Guti's been able to land a strike. Lewis has got to keep those hands up high. Kick. Yeah, found his range, didn't he? Lewis Long looking back at us going, ah, I'm not just a grappler. <laughs> Guti is certainly proving that his stand-up's good here. Long's targeting that forward leg of Guti, and he's having some real success with those kicks. looking for those takedowns. There's another of those hook kicks. I'm putting a lot of energy out here, but seems to be breathing normal. All those kicks, especially the ones that miss, just take extra energy. That's a good right hand by Goody. More success there from Goody. Time that Long has landed that hook kick now. Not having too much impact on Thibaut Guti. That was a clean left hook by Guti on that exit. So I'm stuffed to take down, lands that shot. That puts it in Lewis Long's mind that eh, maybe I don't want to do that again. Beautiful right hand. Right hand from Long, but there's much more power in those punches of Guti. Starting to put the punches together now. Right hand though from Long. Just when you think, oh, I got him going. Good straight right there from Guti. 
feel that sting Lewis long. Rudy needs to just settle himself down. Don't look for the knockout, just look to touch him. And the knockout's gonna come. There it is. He's 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 starting to unload straight right hand. Oh long there with that elbow. That was the touch of the Oliver Encamps there from Lewis Long. It's and then the up kick. Just skimmed by. Love now to both of their noses. Action-packed opening round here. Oh, Gooty again, out. landing the left hook. They're both oh. going to enjoy it. But Long's on his back. Gooty with the left hook. Wow. Right at the end of the round, but end Long is in pain here, John. Just the end of the round. I know what it, a shot that was. No, it seems that a lot of people thought he stopped the fight. It was you could not hear the bell. The referee had counted down. He stopped it once he got to a certain count. Let's take a look at what happened right at the end. Goody goes after him. Beautiful shots right here. This is right. This isn't the, the end sequence. Here comes the end sequence. The gum shield to come out. The mouthpiece is out. Lewis Long is hit with that left hook, and that left hook has been money throughout this fight for Goody. And the question is, has Lewis Long had long enough to get over it? He's got a big smile on his face, but he's got the nose is busted. He's got, a lot, more, he's got a lot more on his face than a smile. And now this French crowd Get behind the French fighter. Look at the smile on the Welshman's face, though. Goes for that kick to the body. The bravery, though, of these fighters is, as we always say, is something else. But Guti at the moment can't miss as Long looks for the takedown that now he desperately needs. You know, Long, Long is talking to Guti. What he's trying to do is he's trying to get him into the brawl. But now Long again on his back, Guti close to the finish. Yeah, it felt like he was, leg. but look at this. Careful. It's a little bit, he does not have it in position right now. There you go. But Guti's got to be careful. Long is dangerous on the ground. And his leg locks are he's outstanding with him. Long needs to get out of here, though. Face is a mask of blood now, Lewis Long. His face is a mess. <laughs> Lewis taking a lot of shots here, still fighting back though. They both look tired. <laughs> I wonder why. Great pace by both guys. Not even halfway here in the fight, and you can see that. It's slowed down now significantly. Guti's found some power from somewhere, though. Guti needs to go back to that left hook. He's been able to land that left, left hook almost every time he's thrown it. Set it up, throw the left hook. He's hurt Lewis Long multiple times with it. Crowd booing, but finally Brian Minor probably does the right thing. Listen to this Parisian crowd getting behind Thibaut Guti. Swing there from Long, who just hasn't been able to get his man here where he wants him. Lewis Long has been as tough as a $2 steak in this fight. I mean, he is just going nowhere.
still standing in the middle of the cage, but the left hand, the jab and the hook. Goody just needs to go back to that left hand. Do you look at Goody here and wonder how much he's got left? He's one or two of these punches feel like arm shots at the moment. And Long still there. He won't go away. And they both know if that left hook had landed 10 seconds earlier, Guti gets the win in the opening round. Possibly. But it didn't. <laughs> you know, if, you, if you're Guti in this situation, what you need to do is just tell yourself, it doesn't matter, just going to keep touching you, just like you're seeing right here. Don't try to load up. Just keep telling yourself, I'm just going to keep touching you. Just keep touching you. Eventually, those shots will add up, and you'll watch your man start to fall down. If you're Lewis Long, you got to say, I got to switch this up into a different element. I got to get this fight to the ground where I am superior. The question is, how's he going to do it? There's a minute remaining in round number two. Lewis looking for the swing. Looking for that spinning attack. Nope. Oh. Yeah, Gucci apologized straight away there. And of course, he's going to use the time now. That would be a smart man. <laughs> Just, yeah. Don't, there's no reason to rush back. Get yourself straight. There you see him push twice. Pushed out twice against. That's what ended up catching him in the eye. You gotta love the look on Lewis Long. He's happy to be here. Well, he says his greatest strength is how much he enjoys what he does, however it goes. Well, look, he's still in this fight, just because his face has got a little blood on it. He has fought well at times. He's taken some big damage. But he's also had his opportunities. I just think that Lewis needs to figure out a way to work himself into that clinch, get the takedown, because on the ground, he's got an advantage. Elbow there from Gucci, and then that really accurate kick to Very. end the second round. Very nice finish by Gucci. Some of that work from Guti from the second round here. Taking so much this out of both fighters. Well, the thing that's really worked for Guti so far in this is that jab and that left hook. His left hand has been just money in this fight. Here he goes after Long with some ground and pound, some hammer fist. But the left hand, you see Long right away looking for the sweep doesn't get it but they get to that position where he can get back to his feet both guys just putting it out there in the stand-up good he's putting on a performance here long tough as the nails man he is just in this fight and I love his attitude look at him look at his opponent he's smiling he's ready to go that's a crazy man Well, they want to have a look at. Well, he's got a split. Face. He's got a split in his nose, I believe. See how he's got the cut on the nose? Yeah. That's what they're looking at. And the French doctor's looking at it going, yeah, no problem. I think he's just told the French doctor to get out of the cage. <laughs> I'm all right. Talking to each other here. They know each other well, used to train together. Long still fancies the job here. Not, not a bad move by Long in trying to get that. <laughs> yeah, Gucci's telling him to get up, giving him the route to his feet because that's where he wants him. 
It's just now in the third round with all the blood, the sweat, he's a little bit slippery. It's going to be a lot more difficult to get into those legs and get that takedown from out in the middle of the cage. He'd be better off using his hands, force him back towards that fence, get into the body lock, and then work from there. It's a dangerous question to ask tonight so far, but is there any argument about the opening two rounds belonging to Guti? There's a lot of arguing. Have you seen some of the scores? <laughs> you know what I mean, though. Is that uh, how yes. you would have it? I would have Guti up. No doubt he's the guy that's done the most damage. He's been the guy that's had the fight ending sequences. Although you you admire and respect the toughness of Lewis Long, you can't give him credit for the scores for it. For that elbow there, Lewis Long but fell well short. Hasn't been able to find a way to get Guti down. As long as Guti keeps landing accurately like that, there's only one winner here. Long well, bringing some power on those kicks to the body. Guti needs to continue to stick with that left hand. The jab, the hook. All of it. Crowd is so engrossed in this. Having a bit more success at times in this third round. Yeah, he's been able to touch Goody a couple of times. But whenever, whenever Goody throws that jab, you watch Lewis Long's head pops back like a Pez dispenser. Right on cue. Yep. Oh, the uppercut. Again, the smile on the face of Lewis Long. Guti's just taunting him and then trying to land that jab at Long. Close to the takedown that time. So often this sport is about getting the fight where you want it, controlling it to that extent, and that's what Guti's done cleverly here. Thrown the most significant punch of the fight by some distance, that left hook right at the end of round one. Yeah, no doubt about Guti's been the guy being able to control. Even though you're seeing Lewis come forward, he's not finding that ability to close the range and land the shots that he wants. Cheer him over the line. Duty surely does enough. And really, Long never quite was able to recover from that punch at the end of the opening round. Much though he tried, he could never get Guti down. No, never got him in the position where he'd have a big advantage. He had the leg lock at one time, but it, it had slipped past the hip area pretty quickly. Guti was able to just dominate the stand-up, and that left hand, the jab, the uppercut, the hook, I mean, it was money for him throughout the fight. 
percentage wise he had to hit that thing at least about 60 percent incredible. Well, they're both uh, needing a fair bit of patching up here. And Thibaut Guti make it four wins in a row if he uh, gets this decision. It never quite worked out for Lewis Long. Some big names on view later on and Yoel Romero and the crowd here excited by that. They can see those pictures on the big screen. He is in the house. Big, big fight against Alex Easy Polizzi coming up later on. He looks really well this week and he looks cool and calm on his way in. Let's get up now though to Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, we go now to your three judges at cage side, where all three, David Torelli, Ben Cartridge, Sal D'Amato, see it exactly the same, 30 to 27. I'll have it for the winner by unanimous decision, GT, Tipo Guti. Guti gets it by unanimous decision. We've got a lot more coming your way one more prelim to come and then of course so much more next friday night bellator mma returns to the ovo arena wembley as london's own number one ranked michael venom page collides with logan storm storley for the interim welterweight world championship then the Bellator cage returns stateside Friday, June 24th from Mohegan Sun Arena for yet another title tilt. Middleweight world champion Gegard Mousasi looks for his 50th career victory when he faces undefeated Johnny Eblen. It's a globe-trekking Bellator championship extravaganza only on Showtime. Let's go! Heavyweight champion Ryan Darth Vader heads to France. Heavyweight title on the line for a towering title rematch Boom. against French legend Czech Congo. Me like the enemy. One win away from the biggest victory of his story career. And this time, they look to leave no doubt. Congo unloading, Vader exploding. As the city of light becomes the city of fight. Bellator heavyweight championship on the line. Bellator MMA live from Paris. Vader vs. Congo 2 today on Showtime. So we have Nijelski against Carvalho, our final prelim. What a night of prelims so far. Let's get them into the cage for the final one with Michael C. Williams. And now ready to make his way to the cage, Piotr Nijelski. Well, the more casual MMA fan may not have heard a lot about Piotr Nijelski, but it would be wise of us all not to overlook a fighter who comes here on the back of eight consecutive wins. The pole is here for a reason, to test Pedro Carvalho for sure, but also possibly to leapfrog him, bring his recent form into the Bellator cage, and the promotion may suddenly have a new star on their hands, a fighter who would have won nine in a row and would be celebrating the biggest victory of his career. He may start as the B-side, but he's one perfect night away from being an instant hit here, this fella. You know, he, he comes in wearing that Pitbull shirt, and you think of the Pitbull brothers. Now, he's not with them, but he fights it with a Pitbull's attitude. Super strong, very aggressive. He just needs to be careful of overextending against Carvalho, but this guy is fun to watch. And now making his way, Pedro, the game. Carvalho. Pedro Carvalho says that he's coming for that belt again, that he's here to prove that he is the best, that for all that he might have failed in that title challenge against Patricio Pitbull, he is resilient, and on the way back to the summit, 
That win last time against Daniel Weichel showed us that he's pulled himself out of the darkness of two defeats. He's once more upwardly mobile, and maybe this immensely likable Portuguese fighter fighting out of Dublin at SBG Island can earn himself another shot of the title, another tilt at real glory. That's where he wants to be. Look, Pedro's got the full game. That's why he's called the game. He lost confidence off of that pit bull fight. Then he got a fight too fast, but the man can fight MMA. He is fun to watch. He's got a height advantage of 5'11 over 5'8. He's got a, basically records are very close, age is close. This is going to be a great matchup. Great matchup. Let's get to Michael C. Williams. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the time has come to conclude. The prelims here at Bellator 280 will do it with three five-minute rounds in the featherweight division. Introducing first, fighting out of the blue corner at five foot eight, weighing in 145.2 pounds. His professional record: 16 wins, four losses. From Poznan, Poland, presenting Piotr Nijelski. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot eleven, weighing in 145 pounds. The former title challenger enters with 12 professional victories, five defeats from Guinness, Portugal. He fights out of Dublin, Ireland. Pedro, the game, Carvalho. In charge, your referee Jacob Montalvo. So Pedro Carvalho in those red gloves against Southpaw Piotr Nijelski. This dangerous pole. And what are we looking for early on here, John? Really, for Nijelski, what you're looking for is look for that straight left hand that he throws down the pipe. It is fast. It is powerful. Pedro puts a lot of pressure on his opponents. He likes being the guy that is putting his opponent on the back foot. He's good at it. But Pedro needs to change levels when he uses his punches, get into the clinch, and work towards a ground game attack. Nijelski, very, very strong. Lost on April Fool's Day. In 2017 since then eight consecutive wins this unquestionably a, a step up for him one that many feel he's more than capable of making and he landed a right hand there he did he touched the chin that right hand landed watch for that left hand that's his bread and butter He looks really solid at the weight, doesn't he? He's a big man. At 145 pounds, he looks considerably bigger than Carvalho. Feels like Carvalho is having a good look here at Nijelski. a journey already in the sport of MMA and in the Bellator cage, Pedro Carvalho. <laughs> Defeat by Pitbull and he admits now that he came back far too early against J.J. Wilson, was in no kind of state really for that fight. That's why last time out against Michael was such a big win for him. Well, that was the first loss for Pedro in Bellator, and he took it hard, and he wanted to get back right away to get it back. Sometimes you need to take your time. You need to slow things down, get yourself back in the gym, work on the things that, you know what, possibly led to your defeat against Pitbull, 
he went back too fast in my opinion and, and now he believes that too but his win against Weichel was outstanding right here nice defense took some shots but he's, he's making most of those bounce off of his arms and hands Jelski is getting through with one or two of these yeah, shots. There, oh, certainly that with that hand. one. That, Straight left hand that you call, John. That's that left hand that he, he just, it is his bread and butter, and eventually he lands it. This is where I actually think, even though Pedro's on his back, he's better here on the ground than Jelski. He's got a better attack as far as submissions, and he goes after things more like you're seeing with the elbows here so we'll see if he can tie Nijilski up and cause problems or if Nijilski's ground and pound gets the best of him. And Nijilski was just looking for a little bit of daylight there so he could do some damage. And this is actually good for Pedro. You, know, you look at that. He took a big shot. He was hurt. So being on his back, not the worst thing because he can collect himself, get himself back in the fight. See his blood under that right eye of Carvalho. Carvalho doing a pretty good job here. He's doing an outstanding job. I mean, he's kind of like that annoying wasp that's hovering over you and all of a sudden it's stinging you and you just can't stop it from doing things. And that's why you see Nijelski back on his feet. Go from a wasp to a little bit of cat and mouse <laughs> at the end of this opening round. John Kavanagh there with uh, Pedro Carvalho. I think that uh, the Jelski corner, Bartosz Zezieski leading the way there will be fairly happy with that though they have to be happy with that that was that was a good round here comes that straight left hand right down the pipe right on the chin he's got power on it now i'm not sure that he should have gone right down to the ground with pedro at this point he might have backed off and if he had backed off gotten pedro back to his feet maybe could have hurt him worse Pedro did a good job of drawing him down into the ground, using his ground attack to at least slow down what Nijilski was able to do, but definitely that was Nijilski's round. So round two. Piotr Nijelski starting really well. This pole from Poznan. Using that size and strength. Good boxing ability. That left hand has probably won in that opening round. Here he comes again, Carvalho. Again blocking uh, a couple of those shots, but still good pressure from Nijelski. Carvalho using a really nice high guard. Nijelski needs to take a look with, with as high as Pedro's hands are at times. Think about going down to the body. got some fans in here but right now Nijelski's doing some really good work Nijelski getting that takedown Pedro turning Gonna get himself back to his feet. He's gonna watch the knees. I like the pressure that I'm seeing out of Carvalho and what he's doing here. He's got Nijelski on his nice job. Nijelski. 
That's what I was talking about, his strength and his power. Every time I watched him, he would get into a position and go, oh, he's starting to fade a little bit. All of a sudden, boom, he would be hitting these big takedowns. I'm like, the man is strong. And when he, he, when he goes into that blast double, he gets people down. It's almost like a tackle. He trains with high-level fighters in his gym, Boris Mankowski, Matthias Gamrock, Lukas Rajewski. Really tight team and starting to enjoy himself in there. Not Straight. having it all his own way, but it couldn't have gone much better for the pole. Right hand, though, from Carvalho was a good shot. Both of them landed good shots right there. The Ryle's still in it. Jelski was able to switch things up with these takedowns just like that. Now he's got Carvalho in the, in the realm of, I'm not just going to stand with you. I will take you down and make you work. So Carvalho has to slow down his attack a little bit. So these sequences right here just don't come too often. He's been training wrestling since he was 11 years old. That was his route into things. Nijelski. Did feel beforehand that this was one of those no-win fights for Carvalho. If he wins, he gets no credit. If he loses, he takes a step back. You know, and that's it's so true, Dave, because you're looking, you're saying Carvalho's ranked. Nijelski's coming in here, but then you look at Nijelski and you go, man, this dude can fight. This guy's good. And if Carvalho wins, people aren't going to give him any real credit for you know, a good win against a really good fighter. And if he loses, he loses a lot of rank. He loses everything. He goes down. And no one's going to say you know, anything about, oh, you lost to a good fighter. Jelski getting a little tired. Well, there's two flying knees there from Carvalho. Jelski just breathing a little bit heavy. He's breathing through his mouth, and he's on his back foot right now. The pressure of Carvalho is starting to pay off. Carvalho keeps piling on the pressure. Yeah, he wants to breathe in Nijelski. See, the last thing you want to do if you're Carvalho right now is stop. If there's anything that Nijelski wants, it's just slow down for a second. Just stay still for a second. If you're Carvalho, you want to make him work, continue on with that pressure on his arms, make his heart rate continue to climb. And he's going to get a breather in 10 seconds' time. But he gets one now. He got one there, a little off target. <laughs> it went straight. It definitely hit the groin area, but... Not one that you would think is going to cause Nijelski not to be able to continue on. It definitely hits the top. It hits the top of the cup. And Nijelski knows what he's doing as well oh, here. Yeah. He's getting a breath, <laughs> which I don't blame him. Look at it. This all comes down to when we talk, we say, if you're not cheating, you ain't trying. Well, look, you got fouled, and so now I get to be in control of this time. I was getting tired. I'll admit it to myself. I'm not going to admit it to you. I'm going to sit here, and I'm just going to take my time before I say I'm ready to go again, and then I'll go, and I'll feel much better once I get my air back. But all that work by Pedro to get his heart rate up high just got taken away by that one kick. That could be a really significant moment it in this definitely fight. Definitely be. A few seconds remaining in this second round. And Nijelski might just be a renewed fighter coming into round three. This one's still in the balance. How are you scoring it, John? Man, I'll tell you what, this one is in the balance. It could be that, you know, Pedro Carvalho is actually down two rounds. It could be that it's 1-1. One, one here because Pedro was really coming on. But I, I think Pedro needs to do something special here in this third round. Well, we know he's more than capable of that. There's a little bit of back and forth between them. 
Nice, nice hook to the body, bringing it back up to the head. And this is where Pedro was really starting to turn it on. Jelski started to try to gain distance, starting to get a little bit tired. The wrestling was a big factor for Nijelski early in that second round. He was able to get a lot of takedowns. Wasn't able to do anything really with it, but at least showed that he could control the position of the fight. Third and final round then. Pedro Carvalho, as John said, might just need something very, very special here. These two strong family men, Nijelski said his biggest motivation is his family. Got two children. Pedro has Benjamin and Carlina. Again, uh, the referee didn't like the kick. Again, Nijelski gets another rest. It, it definitely, you could hear it hit the cup, so there's no doubt the kick was off target. It, I don't know if it was based upon movement, not really. Watch it come up. Yeah, it comes right up the middle. Valio was uh, looking up at the uh, big screen, the enormous screen in this arena. And, uh, shaking his finger at Nijelski. Yeah, well, he would be wrong about that. It, it hit the wrong spot. He knows deep down. These little pauses, they're only helping one of the fighters in there, and it's not Pedro Carvalho. <laughs> a dent in this really strong pole. Coming down in weight to fight. Carvalho, has that drained him at all? He could definitely put a dent. Like attacking the body is a smart move by Pedro. All it takes is one clean body shot to put you back into that deprivation of oxygen and the ability to breathe. When you think of Carvalho at his best, you think of him swarming opponents, though, and high energy, and he high just hasn't managed to get going yet. There's still time, though. He, look, he's a pressure fighter. He comes forward. You know he's going to come at you, swing. I'm surprised that he hasn't gone towards a little bit more of a grappling situation because in the top position, he's damn good. Once again, it's Nijelski looking for the takedown. And when Nijelski almost got into that, what we call that double leg tackle, and Pedro did a very nice job at least getting one leg free to bounce back and balance off of it. Now he's using the cage for that. Well, Pedro Carvalho said that one of the things he learned from those two defeats was not to rush. Be patient enough to find holes in your opponent. Still hasn't really found a hole in this fella. Still time, though, for him to do damage. A nice slick move by Pedro. You saw him reaching across, grabbing the offside of the jaw, turning the head out to get away from him in the clinch. And again, same as Nijelski kind of made that mistake in getting down on his opponent. Same thing with Pedro Carvalho right now. He had him hurt and immediately went after him and then got caught. His position was able as far as he can't posture right now. You see Nijelski holding on there. He needs to frame out and break those hands. Times against Carvalho here.
heavy elbows, though. And again, starting to break him down. Is he here, Carvalho? Carvalho needs to continue to do that, roll his arms out and bring heavy strikes, either punches or elbows. Nice elbows shifting over right through the middle of the guard. See, and all this is scoring, and he's winning the round, but it's not going to win him the fight. Probably. <laughs> True. And it's much better this from Carvalho, but is it too little, too late? Just a moment, wasn't it, when it looked like he was really going to break things open, but Jelski's done a good job of limiting the damage here. Jelski's taken a lot of shots to the body. You know, he's held on. He's got that full guard, but he's limited the big shots. That's the difference. You know, Carvalho's surely winning this third round, but will that be enough? That's the question now that hands over this. Smiles, Carvalho, the showmanship, suggesting he might have done enough. But how would you score it? I, I had Nijelski winning those first two rounds. I have Pedro Carvalho winning the third. Not enough for a 10-8 round. Good round, but I think Nijelski edges it out. And again. It might just take a while to get these scorecards together. Let's take a look at the uh, action then from that third and final round. That was a clean right hand. That definitely hit the target. That's why you see Nijelski tried to hold his position. Beautifully done right there by Pedro. The big problem for Pedro in that position is, look, he's just going for the finish, and I don't blame him, but he misses with the hammer fist and then gets caught in that position where if he had backed off, made the referee stand his opponent up, might have gotten that knockout. Well, the fighters are ready. Michael is up in the cage, and he is ready too. Let's get now to Michael. Ladies and gentlemen, for the decision, we go now to your first judge, Michael Bell, who scores the fight 29 to 28. He sees the fight for Nijelski. Your second judge, Brian Miner, 29 28. He has it for Cavalu. Your third and final judge at cage site, Ben Cartledge, 29 28. For the winner, by split decision, Piotr Nijelski. Nijelski gets it. Big win for him. We're moments away from our main card, live on Showtime and PBC3. Heavyweight champion Brian Darth Vader heads to France. Heavyweight title on the line. For a towering title rematch Boom. against French legend Czech Congo. One win away from the biggest victory of his storied career. And this time, they look to leave no doubt. Congo unloading, Vader exploding. As the city of light becomes the city of fight. Bellator, heavyweight championship on the line. Bellator MMA, live from Paris. Vader versus Congo.
see that right now. Welcome back to Paris, France. Welcome back to the Icor Arena. Being in France, big crowd and all that, that does not add pressure to me. It does bring a really good uh, flavor and taste of what French fighters in MMA can do. Make the new generation proud, proud about who we are, you know, what we do, and how great is a great sport. It's a bad position, yeah. Anthony Johnson. And then it's all over. The point with Wayne Bader, you know, except the, the, the fact he poked me in the eyes. You know, even at the Wayans, he used to touch me with the hat, and that thing I didn't like. For sure, I have to react. As an athlete, as a professional, yes, technically, I don't have anything against him. And what I don't like is when people don't play fair. From my perspective, you know, uh, I don't know what happened. I do not think I poked him in the eye, but we'll see. Watch the replay. I'm like, where was the poke? You know, and, uh, and then at the press conference, you got to ask the question, why did you say it was your eye when the video was shown it was your nose? And he said, well, maybe it was the uppercut before, which is a legal punch, you know, but he started saying it was intentional and I would never do anything intentional to foul another fighter. I'm a professional, have never done that in any of my 40 plus fights. Oh, the right hand, uh, I fought a tough fight.